with us or our macrophages. Classes of cytokines, you can say, well, there's some that are associated with acute, there's some associated with chronic, and they're, they're classified. But there's a broad class of these. There, there's not one or five. There's like dozens and dozens and dozens, and they keep finding them. And we're going to talk about some specific ones right here that we keep seeing popping up in the, in the field of periodontics and, and uh, general inflammation. The definition of a cytokine is just a low molecular weight soluble protein that's made in response to an antigen which functions as a chemical messenger and, and, and regulates the immune response. They're pleiotropic, they're redundant, and they're multifunctional. They have broad applications. They, the one can work on many, and many can work on one, and they all have redundancy. That's just what a chemokine and a cytokine uh, are. Okay, now uh, three or four of them in particular, because you're gonna, as you do reading in the literature, these keep popping up with regards to what we are concerned about in periodontics. And one, the first one is tissue necrosis factor alpha. It's produced mainly by the macrophages. It's the principal cytokine, which, immedi which mediates acute inflammation. It stimulates inflammation in endothelial cells and helps white blood cells, uh, white blood cells migrate into tissue spaces. It's a chemoattractant for white blood cells. It helps macrophages secrete interleukins 1 and, and prostaglandin. It increases insulin resistance in tissues, and it stimulates the acute phase reaction in liver. Again, when you get your notes um, in the handouts, all this is going to be on there, so you don't have to scribble real quick. But that's what a cytokine, uh, a tissue necrosis factor uh, protein is all about. You're also going to read a lot about and hear a lot about interleukin 1s. Uh, these promote acute inflammatory response. They stimulate the liver to produce uh, acute phase reactants, such as CRP, which is what we all talk about. Uh, it stimulates the coagulation pathway. It promotes synthesis of collagen and other collagenase enzymes for tissue repair. They increase adhesion factors on endothelial cells to enable migration of white blood cells. They stimulate increased tissue temperature to help fight the infection. A matrix metalloproteinase, or MMP, as they're called, is another one. These are uh, tissue, uh, TNF-alpha and interleukin-1 produce the MMPs. It's a zinc-containing enzyme, hence the term uh, metallo. Uh, they're enzymes involved in bone and connective tissue destruction. These are proteinases, they're collagenases. These destroy and cut apart and lyse apart connective tissue. That's why they can degrade the fibrous capped on the intimal wall or the blood vessel wall. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Acute phase reactants are secondary cytokines manufactured in the liver in response to primary uh, cytokines such as TNF, alpha, and interleukin-1. Those upregulate hepatocytes in the liver to produce uh, these acute phase reactants. CRP obviously is the main one that we all talk about. It activates the complement cascade and it stimulates chemotaxis of phagocytes through uh, opsonizing bacteria surfaces. That's like a, in, in wartime when they paint the target with a laser so that the, the missile knows where to strike. That's what obstinization means, is that it's painting the target so now that we can go, the white blood cell can phagocytize and kill it. Um, and there's a systemic effect with uh, these acute phase reactants throughout the body. So I can have distant tissue organs and sites being affected because of the presence of these uh, cytokines. A chemokine is a cytokine, um, except this is more cellular. Uh, on the surface, it's a chemoattractant that helps. It helps draw, uh, such as through uh, diapedesis or the migration of of uh, fluids and cells through through uh, tissue structures, through through basement membranes, so it can get out into tissue spaces. It also uh, invites uh, uh, the attractant of processes of other white blood cells and chemicals to an area to help defend it. Everything we've talked about, with maybe the exception of this, of the acute phase reactants. Um, and I think the jury's still out on that, but all of this so far that we've talked about is good, it's positive, it's part of our defense mechanism, and it's necessary for life. When you look at this picture and say, well, if I had tissue injury, it's probably going to be extravascular. It's going to be outside, um, you know, if I get punctured by a nail or I, uh, I get cut and bacteria gets into it, it's like, how does the body deliver the defense, the, the, the troops to the site? Uh, how does it get out of the bloodstream and into the tissue spaces so that these processes can happen? Again, just by way of illustration, the concept of diapedesis or moving uh, the plasma, the contents of plasma, the biochemicals in the plasma, as well as the immune cells themselves, into the extravascular uh, tissues, is part of what the what these cytokines are mediating. They're they're directing the traffic. They're allowing the process to occur naturally, and all of this is good. 
So the effects of cytokines are to increase uh, inflammation, to cr increase uh, vasodilation, to have coagulation. Coagulation is important because the body wants to wall off the area of injury. If it can coagulate, it can stop, it can confine, it can build a barrier in that area. And that's just part of the way the, the system works. Obviously, transmigration or diapedesis, uh, elevated fever or temperature in the, in the tissues, and then uh, the, um, the creation and movement of extracellular biochemicals. Again, a cytokine is nothing more than just a chemical messenger. It's mediating, it's directing the traffic, it's starting the processes of, of defense. So in summary, the innate or inborn immunity is an acute inflammation in the immediate and short-term localized protective response to tissue injury, whatever nature it is. Inflammatory cytokines initially prepare, mediate, and control the body's response to local injury. We want that. We like that. It's necessary for life. The problem here is the Jekyll and Hyde thing. While I have acute inflammation as the primary responder, it's the initial response to the problem, the question is, well, what happens and, and, and how does this occur when it becomes chronic, when it persists, when it stays too long? Um, there's a shift in the type of cells involved. The chemicals change. We start to get uh, uh, tissue destruction as well as some repair occurring. And most importantly, perhaps to the discussion here and where we're going to take this, is that it becomes systemic in nature. Chronic inflammation. Systemic inflammation is the presence of pro-inflammatory proteins circulating in the bloodstream. So when, when, when a physician speaks of inflammation, we're not talking about swollen thumbs or swollen tissues. We're talking about the presence of proteins that are freely circulating in the bloodstream, which I could put a needle in my artery or vein and suck the blood out and analyze it and see those proteins in a blood specimen. That's what we're saying. Going back to this uh, overview here, again, we have the, the uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, uh, the endotoxins, lipopolysaccharides from the bacterial cell walls, initiating this process, upregulating my macrophage uh, DNA to transcribe and translate the uh, production of cytokines, which then kick off these processes uh, in my immune system. And now we're going to shift into, okay, what happens when that just persists? And this is where we start to talk about the chronicity or the, the lingering effects of uh, what we're now going to call chronic inflammation. This schematic just shows, well, we have a challenge. We have a bacterial uh, uh, parasite or whatever uh, in on our body. It's, a, it's a playing on local tissue. We have to recognize that there has to be a susceptible host. There has to be some genetic expression. And there's great uh, variability in that because some people are genetically predisposed to reacting more to those stimulants because of the way the genetic expression and the, gen the upregulation goes. And so some are going to be more responsive, some are going to be less responsive. But the bottom line is we all develop the, um, the interleukin-1s and the TNFs and, the, and so forth as the primary chemical messengers in the immune system. And there's several effects of this. Um, that result in inflammation, a pro-oxidant state, which we'll talk about in a minute, oxidative stress, the activation of MMPs and, and osteoclasts, which now uh, get into the issue of tissue destruction and repair, as well as the, the development of interleukin-6, which then upregulates the hepatocytes to produce uh, C-reactive protein. So on the right side, we have all these things happening as a consequence of a challenge to a host cell and, and uh, a genome that creates this cascade of things that start to happen. In dentistry, we see a periodontal disease, and we, we think of this as the prototypical example of an inflammatory pathology secondary to a bacterial infection. It's, it's just a standard thing. It's a textbook example of this whole process that we've been talking about. <clears throat> And of course, the, the attention lately has been not on the concept of the bugs themselves, but on the biofilms that they organize and colonize. And I trust that we had some discussion about that yesterday. But the biofilm is what this is about, because the deeper into the biofilm I get, the more protected the bugs are. They organize uh, the, the quorum sensing that goes on between the bacteria, where they're talking to each other, and they're voting in mass, and and they think like a, a separate uh, entity now, and they protect themselves from things that happen from the outside world to try to destroy them, uh, that really becomes where periodontics becomes real tricky. 
and it becomes important to understand what you're doing.